Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multi Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call. 1 855 450 NOAA. That's 1 855 450 6624. Or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. It's a dark day on the internet. Article 13, Article 11 have passed 348 in favor, 274 against. This is a means of controlling the internet. And don't be dissuaded. This was a bad thing. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to dig into the show. But as always, your questions come first on the Ask Noah Show. You can join us by phone, 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. You can email us live at asknoahshow.com. Or you can join us in our interactive mumble room, which is what Brent does. Hey, Brent, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah. Good to talk to you. Hey, so, always. Hey, uh, so, so well, I was going to say simple question, but uh, you can decide. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, have a yoga 710 that I'm trying to configure. Uh, I'm trying to put Kubuntu 1804 on it and everything is working great as usual. What I'm running into is, uh, it's a three in one, uh, and I don't have much experience both with the touch screen, uh, on these and the, 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 so the screens all the way back, uh, so that you can sort of lay the computer flat with the keyboard facing down. And uh, so when it's folded back, when the screen is folded back all the way, uh, Kubuntu does a great job of sort of detecting that and turning the keyboard off um, so that you're not sort of mashing buttons on your lap or something like that. Um, but what the user asked of me, which I don't know how to figure out yet, which I'm hoping you can help, is um, when she has the screen only uh, curved back maybe more than 90 degrees, so the keyboard is still down on a surface, but the... Um, uh, the display is sort of at a 45 degree angle on a desk or an airplane tray okay. or something like that. Sure. The keyboard is still on. And I'm just wondering if you have any hints or ideas uh, on yeah, how to make that a little bit uh, more user friendly. You know, I'm not, you know, it, it, so each one of these machines are different. In fact, I was just configuring something not quite exactly the same, but something very similar on uh, on the next one, Carbon, uh, that I've been playing with this week. And um, the, the answer to your question is, each laptop does it a little bit differently, so it depends on if it's controlled in software or in hardware. Do you know if the quote-unquote tablet switch, laptop switch signal is being sent via a hardware switch or if that's being controlled in software? Yeah, so I that's a little bit of the road I started going down um, with some, some searching on the internet. And uh, so I was able to run, I think it was an Exynet uh, command mm -hmm. to try to see if there was a hardware switch that was going. And I, I couldn't really identify if was anything to detect sort of the um, half um, tablet mode. It certainly, there was certainly a switch for the full tablet mode. I think that's how Kubuntu is dealing with it, but I, I can't say for sure, really. There is, um, so in the ThinkPads, and I know you said this is a yoga, but it, they, a lot of them will share a lot of the same, a lot of the same technology and the same build function inside of slash sys slash devices slash virtual slash graphics. Um, there is a, there is a file call or maybe it's another folder called FBCon and inside of there is a file called rotate and I believe that is what it, that's, that's how Linux interprets what to do on, on a given hardware state. We'd have to dig in a little bit more to find out if there's an actual switch. So like, for example, on the X1 Carbon, there is a switch right at the very center of the, of the keyboard essentially. And when that switch is, is there pressure is applied to the switch. That's what lets the, the computer know that the lid is closing. Now my last laptop, I guess it was actually a magnet. And when the magnet got close enough to the, to the end, that that's what would signal the computer that the, the lid was closed. Um, and so understanding how that process works, my, my suspicion is though, with those two in ones, it may actually be a software thing. There may actually be uh, code inside of there. And that's why I point out this, this, uh, virtual graphics, uh, rotate file. There may actually be software in there that, that, that calculates and, and monitors 
at what the state of that closing is so that it can do various things depending on the degree of open or completely shut or, or those kinds of things. Yeah, so no obvious hardware switch on this one, but uh, the magnet okay, there is, uh, is, yeah, the magnet's really uh, interesting. Uh, I, I sort of might have read that it might be in the hinges, there might be a switch or something, but right. uh, uh, at least that gives me a place to, to continue searching and, uh, yeah, to at least have a directory to look in. Can I ask, can I ask, are you using the Wacom driver for the tablet portion of that, or are you using libinput? Uh, Whatever is stock. Okay, that would be libinput. Okay. Yeah. I, so one thing you might consider trying to, and there, it's hit or miss depending on what you read on the internet and which version of Linux and all those kinds of things. But, uh, there is, there's a lot of, uh, talk about the Wacom driver, um, being able to give you a little bit more functionality and a little bit more of a real feel, uh, whereas libinfoot is, is being developed. And I actually, I, I, it's funny that you asked this question this particular week. I stumbled into this because I was trying to fix something on my trackpad on my X1 Carbon, and libinput didn't support a particular f feature set, and Synaptics does. Uh, but in searching for that, I stumbled across a post that was talking about the uh, Wacom drivers that you can install um, to get the tablet, uh, the more natural tablet feeling style thing. Yeah, that is, uh, I think, maybe something that might come up a little bit more. And I, I had to do a little tiny bit of trickery to get Firefox to do some some nice sort of flick scrolling and stuff right. like that. But that was pretty easy. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to see a little bit uh, more work on this from, from everybody who knows how to do the developing side of things. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Brent. We appreciate the question. Yeah, thanks for your answer. Yeah, you bet. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. Email, of course, live at asknoahshow.com. So... The Article 11 and Article 13, this passed through Parliament, so this is now law. It passed, 348 in favor, 274 against. And this is a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because it's a means of controlling the internet. Now, we're going to break down this a little bit into two parts. But essentially, both parts allow the government and large corporate entities to scrub content they don't like from the internet. So content can be removed from the internet if they don't approve. And they're doing this under the guise of copyright, and that's total and complete crap. If you, nobody, many of us have our own movie collections, and some of those movies may or may not have wound up into our collection uh, through illicit means, right? Right. I'm not saying that nobody out there has ever rented a Redbox movie or borrowed a DVD from a friend and ripped it into their collection, okay? But I think we would all acknowledge that that's wrong and that is, that's, not, that's not a legal thing to do. And so there are those of us that believe that content should be open and available. I'm one of those people. All of the content released for Ask Noah is released as Creative Commons. And so you can, you can do whatever you want. The only thing is we ask for no derivatives so people can't take what I say out of context. But you can do whatever you want. You can share it with however many people you want. In fact, we encourage you to do that. We want people to be open. But I've never, ever, ever advocated that happening at the hand of the government, that the government should force people to open up their content. The issue here is that we're, not, we're no longer talking about copyright. We're no longer talking about convincing people to share their content in an open way. We're talking about eliminating people's freedom of their own expression. Because under Article 11 and under Article 13, if you take a screen grab from a movie and turn it into a meme or make a joke with it, technically that can be in violation of Article 11 and Article 13. So like I said, it breaks down into two parts. We'll start with Article 13. That is the database filter. Now the database filter requires all social networks to filter all content uploaded to scan for objectionable material. So the idea is it's like content ID for YouTube, except on a massive scale. Now there's a number of problems with it, socially speaking, but there are some technical limitations as well. The problem that we have here is that it fundamentally puts an onus and a burden financially, technically on the service provider. So if you have a Facebook or a Twitter or a MySpace or a Google Plus or a, a Gab or whatever social network you want to talk about, these people are unable to 
run their companies unless they are complying with Article 13 and scanning for this objectionable material. That is a huge burden. Can you imagine Facebook having to scan every single image and every single video that's uploaded to their social network? What a problem that would be. And how costly would that be for them? And then the second part, and the thing that I actually find to be more egregious is Article 11, which is the link tax. And essentially, Article 11 says that you have to pay to link to a source. And there has to be a license and an agreement in place for you to, to link to somebody else's source material. Now, think about what that does, practically speaking. I is a very small, very, very small news organization, right? We provide news like this and other technical related news. Can you imagine if we entered a world where every time I talked about a story and put a link in the show notes, I had to pay a tax on that. I had to pay, a, I had to pay a company to link to their material. These people can't get their hand in the pot enough ways. First, they charge a lot of times a subscription fee to be able to view some of the content in its entirety. Then they sell ads around that content. And then they try to drive traffic back to their site so that people can watch and click on their ads. And now they want to get paid another time in the form of link backs. They want to charge people to link to their sites. This is ridiculous. And what it does is it stomps out the ability for smaller news organizations to spring up and be competitive because I can't compete with the ZDNets of the world, right? And the smaller news organizations are not going to be able to compete with the CNNs and MSNBCs and the Fox News of the world. And so we're at a fundamental disadvantage. And then they're going to force those smaller organizations to pay money to the larger ones. So the end result is going to be that only large companies are yeah, with any real scale to them are going to be able to participate in this system because they're the only ones that are going to be able to pay for it. And this, I think, is the mainstream media's plan to try to save themselves by forcing smaller companies to pay them for their inaccurate, oftentimes biased and terrible reporting. And these smaller news organizations that try to bring more truth and actually dig in and do what used to be traditional journalism, they don't want those companies to get ahead unless these larger companies are taking a cut. And this is a very scary thing to me. Social media in its entirety, could could pull out of the EU. And I, ha I have seen that happen, not necessarily to this scale and not with social media, but I, I am part of an organization. I shouldn't say part of an organization. I work with a company that does business internationally, and they have a newsletter that they send out every single month that updates its customers on what's going on in the company. And one of the emails that we got last year was, hey, given these new regulations that are coming out on the EU where people have to continually opt in, we, uh, we can't afford to continue to publish the newsletter in the EU. So if you live in the EU, uh, you are not going to be able to receive the newsletter. And if you're outside of the EU, then you need to click this box specifying that your email address doesn't exist inside of the EU. And I watched them fundamentally discontinue service to the EU because of oppressive regulation. And now we're going through that at a whole different scale and much, much worse this time. Don't kid yourself. This is SOPA all over again. Except this time, it's worse. I want people to be open, but I want it to be by choice. I have never advocated for anything less than a maximum absence of coercion from government, and this silences dissent. And if I can put my tinfoil Tuesday hat on a little bit, because it is, tin, because it is Tuesday, how long before people start to say things the government doesn't want them to say, and that gets added to the list of things that can be pulled from the internet? Because under Article 11 and under Article 13... They have to pull objectionable content. They're passing it under the, the guise of copyright. But how long before somebody says something the state doesn't want them to say and they decide, well, we just need to, to pull out of that. And you better believe that as Linux users and open source users and people that advocate for freedom and open source, this is a huge problem for us. A huge, massive, massive problem for us. It is a dark day on the Internet. And I hope that this never comes to the United States. But don't kid yourself. They tried to pass soap, but they just didn't get very far. And now they have precedent. Now they have precedent. Now they have something they can look to and say, look, it passed over here. The sky didn't fall. 
and you are going to have massive media outlets that have big budgets and large corporations that are going to be able to approach the U.S. government and say, hey, look what we did over here. And that worked pretty well. So we'd like to do it over there. And I find that to be, I, 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 I cannot tell you how disgusted I am that this passed. And I cannot to tell you how disgusted I am that as a open source advocate, and Linux advocate, that I'm going to exist in a world now where the last free place on earth is being attacked and they had their first successful win. I really don't like it. The discussion will continue next. I do want to make a stop at the Linux News Riot Wire newsroom with Eric, the IT guy. Here he is. From the Linux News Wire studio, this is the Weekly Roundup with Eric, the IT guy. Hey, Noah. Happy to be with you again. And here are your Linux and open source headlines. First up this week is from the folks over at the Cody Project. The XBMC Foundation, the nonprofit owners of Cody, have joined the Linux Foundation as an associate member. The Cody Project, formerly XBMC, is a multi platform multimedia server. Designed as an open source competitor to Plex, Cody can run on Linux, Windows, OS X, iOS, and Android. It touts such a streamlined functionality that can even play content off of a Raspberry Pi. The XBMC Foundation announced that pairing with the Linux Foundation just made sense, a joining together of two communities of passionate problem solvers. The Linux Foundation, most notable for employing Linus Torvalds, is home to numerous projects and foundations focusing on Linux and the open source ecosystem. Our mission at Linux Newswire is to present the news in a clear, straightforward manner without commentary or a lot of fluff. Sometimes, though, even we have to take a step back and scratch our heads. KDE Connect brought us one of those moments this week when the Google Play Store flagged and removed the app from their store, only to re-add the app less than 24 hours later. KDE Connect, along with its GNOME-based sister GS Connect, are applications designed to integrate Android devices with the Linux desktop much in the way iOS devices have grown to interface with macOS. Google cited that KDE Connect violated policies surrounding third-party applications and SMS integration. Google tried to cite that the SMS functionality was not core to the KDE Connect app, despite that being one of the most popular features. KDE developers worked quickly to release a modified version of the tool with the SMS functionality disabled. The rest of the team worked hard attempting to reach Google support. However, within 24 hours of the application being published on Google Play Store with SMS disabled, Google whitelisted the SMS feature and KDE republished their app with the SMS functionality restored. It is worth noting that the F-Droid alternative was not affected by this incident. Firefox 66 has been released to GA this week. The new version of Mozilla's flagship project is now available for all platforms including Windows, macOS, Linux, iOS, and Android. Linux in particular received lots of attention this go-round, including a tighter-looking interface. This was achieved by enabling CSD by default. CSD, or client-side decorations, combines the title and header bars, allowing more vertical space specifically for web content. Have a lot of tabs? Firefox will now help with that too by allowing a search option on open tabs. Autoplay media by default is now blocked. Woot! Firefox 66 also brings with it performance improvements by moving add-on settings into the Firefox database instead of individual JSON files, a fix for Linux users' downloads panel, and support for scroll anchoring. Also in the announcements for Firefox 66, Mozilla announced that in Firefox 67, the royalty-free video codec AV1 will be supported by default, a huge win for the open source community. A few weeks back, we reported on DigitalOcean's 2019 roadmap. They announced this week the next delivery on that roadmap, proxy protocol support for load balancers. DigitalOcean, friends of the show and customer service-focused VPS provider, have been building on functionality around their SSD-powered KVM-driven virtual servers, or droplets. In a recent blog post, they explained that proxy protocol is the industry standard for passing string formatted data from the open network to a destination server. For example, an IPv4 address. This brings even more power to their built-in Kubernetes offerings. This feature can be enabled via the web portal or their load balancer API for infrastructure automation. You can get started with the DigitalOcean load balancer in any region for just $10 a month. For LinuxNewsWire.com, I am Eric the IT Guy. Now, Noah, back to you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate everything. And, I, I, you know, again, if, if you're still around, I, I want to pick your brain for just a second. Am I overreacting to this uh to this EU story, or is this literally the worst thing that's happened on the internet in the history of time? 
Um, I think if anything, you, your, uh, your explanation is kind of underreacting. Um, I think, uh, as part of an open source community, as part of a group of people that, uh, prefer to help self host their own, their own content. I think, I think with this, we've reached a, a point where we need to start bringing more people into these decentralized services, uh, where there's not a single entity. You know, I think about Twitter where, uh, certain more <clears throat> radical thinking people, shall we say, um, have been banned from the platform and whether you agree with the person or not, it is a form of censorship. Now I understand the argument that, uh, that it's Twitter's platform and it's Twitter's decision whether or not these people should be allowed on their platform. But if it's decentralized and no one person owns it, then then a lot of those uh, more disparate views uh, will will be able to be to be shared. Yeah, I, I I'm I'm very disappointed by what happened in the EU. Do you think there's any chance of this coming to the United States? Because I feel like the amount of money that is behind these corporations. And they're now they've got blood in the water and they can smell it and they know that there's a potential for success. And SOPA did not get beat that bad that it's beyond the concept of a, of a, of a, of a try of a do over. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, it's only a matter of time. And with the way that the media has been treated in this particular political cycle, again, your, your personal beliefs about, about uh, our leadership or, or whatnot aside, it doesn't matter. I mean, the media has been, has been just sidelined unless you unless you say the right things or interview the right people. It's it's just a matter of time. All right. Well, I appreciate the uh, I appreciate everything, Eric. We'll be back next week with another news read. Every week. Appreciate it. That is Eric, the IT guy. Now, my next guest is Michael Hall. He is the lead developer of GetTogether.Community, an open source platform for organizing and building communities. We have used GetTogether to organize the very first uh, official organized, I guess, rather, yeah, Snow get together that we had in California. We're also going to be using it for the uh, for this Friday where we have our first lug in Grand Forks. But joining us on the program is Michael Hall. Hey, Michael, welcome into the program. Hey, thanks for having me on, Noah. Yeah, so first of all, I apologize for my voice. It's a little bit crackly. I'm just getting over a bit of a cold. But um, essentially what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring you on to talk a little bit about Get Together and how this product came out because I hadn't heard anything about it and I hadn't seen anything about it. And all of a sudden, it wasn't on, on my radar and all of a sudden it's everywhere and it seems like everybody is using it and it's really taken off. Tell me, what was the inspiration behind Get Together? So about a year and a half ago, I was at a GNOME conference in uh, Manchester, UK. Um, and one of the sessions that I was a part of there, they were talking about wanting to set up these local uh, GNOME groups in other parts of the world. And they wanted a way to be able to track them and track their events and stuff like that. Um, and at the time I was working at Endless Computers who had a similar interest. They wanted to start bringing up local communities in the areas where they were targeting their computers. Now, previously, I was uh, I'd worked at Canonical on Ubuntu, um, and I got my start in the Ubuntu community working on something called the Ubuntu Local Team Portal, which was essentially that. It was for the Ubuntu local communities to use to uh, promote and track their events. So the idea came there to produce some kind of a generic system, something that was like the Local Team Portal, but not specific to Ubuntu, um, that could be used by open source communities instead of paying for Meetup, which runs between like 10 and $15 a month per group, which can add up pretty quick, especially if you're, you know, just a, a community project. So that kind of sat and simmered over the fall and into the winter. Uh, and over Christmas break that year, I just started putting together um, a Django app to do this. And so that was right at the start of 2018. So we're a little bit more than a year old now, um, but that's where it all came from. Um, a lot of the initial feedback I got was just throwing questions out on Twitter. You know, how should this work? What should it look like? What should the um, support model be for it? What should the name be? Um, so that all kind of, it was all based on community feedback that I was getting. I'm interested to find out where you see this project evolving to or where you see uh, this project heading because previously, all of the Linux meetups that I was familiar with were all using uh, um, Meetup. 
And today, what we're seeing is a lot of the free and open source and Linux community meetups that are occurring are actually being scheduled with Get Together, not the least of which is the Ask Noah Show and the Grand Forks Linux Users Group. And so it seems like this is picking up pace very, very quickly. I've seen just in the last 30 days how many organizations have switched from get to, uh, from Meetup over to Get Together. I'm wondering, is this growing faster than maybe you had anticipated? Uh, I really didn't know what to anticipate at first. Um, I had originally built it to be a federated system so that maybe each community, like the Ubuntu community, can run an instance the Debian community could run an instance. Um, so I set up gettogether.community just as a free public instance to start off this federated network. Um, I didn't really expect that many people to uh, use it instead of setting up their own instances, but it's really become popular for like one-off teams who, you know, it doesn't make sense to run your own instance if it's just for one team. Um, and there was a need for that. And I think especially among the open source community, there was a desire to use an open source service instead of uh, a meetup one. I agree with that. And I also think there is a desire in the community to get away from paid models, right? Because I, I don't think that every organization has necessarily the funds to allocate to just a resource for coordinating a, a get together. Um, and the nice thing is, so get together being open source means that people can host their own instance if they don't want to use the service get together, which is get together dot community. Is that correct? That is. And the federated uh, code is still there. So if somebody stood up their own instance, we could still share event data and I could list you know events from their instance. They can list events from my instance. And that takes care of a lot of the uh, um, that uh, fragmentation problem you get when you try and compete with social networks. What is the protocol being used to federate those events? Is it the same protocol that is being used on some of the other open source social networks, or is this something that you guys designed from the ground up? Uh, right now, it's using just a really basic JSON uh, API. Uh, very simple. It was the, the fastest thing I could do to get federation working. There are some elements of ActivityPub, which is, I think, the protocol you're thinking of. That's Correct. the one that powers Mastodon and uh, a couple of other you know, non-Twitter competing uh, federated services. So there's some initial support for that. There's still some work to do. I'm still trying to understand the protocol itself and how that's supposed to work and how that's supposed to work specifically with something that's providing events instead of status updates or, or content. Um, so I'm still learning that. I'm still trying to get help and advice from people who are more familiar with that. The end goal is to use ActivityPub um, to federate all of our instances. But right now, it the is. simple okay. service works you know, well enough. How large is the team that is, uh, that is managing uh, Get Together? Is it just yourself or are there a couple other people involved? Uh, I'm the main contributor so far. There have been four or five people who have been contributing patches or additional features here and there. Uh, it's starting to pick up a little bit. But, you know, for a long time, it was just me doing it when it was early um, before it started gaining traction. So I'm hoping now as we get more people using it, more teams using it, that some of them will start providing contributions directly back to it as well. What are some of the advantages of Get Together over something like Meetup? Uh, maybe just from the standpoint of obviously it's, it's free and open source and those things are valuable to us in the open source community. Are there any competitive advantages just from a platform perspective? So one of the early concerns that a lot of people had uh, was around privacy. And I did use Google services for a lot of things. I used Google Analytics. Um, but I added an option, a do not track option. So you can set that on your account. You don't want to be tracked and it won't even load the analytics code on the pages when you're viewing them. Um, the one thing that's currently not replaceable that's Google based is the maps. There's been a lot of requests to use open street maps for that. So if we can get the necessary data and APIs from them, then we'll make that an option too. And uh, these are per instance settings too. So if you wanted to stand up your own instance that didn't use uh, Google Analytics at all, you could do that. Somebody's contributed a uh, Matomo, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, it's an open source analytics service. Um, and somebody's contributing it, an instance for me to use for that. And so now we have code and get together where you can uh, use that instead of Google Analytics. 
What are some of the other future things we might be able to look forward to with Get Together? Obviously, like you say, it's one of those things, a tool that was created out of necessity, more or less, and uh, maybe didn't expect it to blow up as much as it did. But you must have some idea of a roadmap of things that you'd like to see ha happen down the road. I think one of the big things is the um, kind of the, the pro feature set that Meetup has where you can have an organization with multiple uh, teams under it. And we have some of that already, um, but there's a lot more features, I think, that can be added there to make it more useful, especially to um, bigger communities or companies that are organizing a global community uh, to give them the features that they need there. Can you talk a little bit about the funding model of GetTogether.Community? Obviously, you're providing it to the community for free, but it must cost something. What does the revenue model look like for GetTogether? So you mentioned earlier that it's you know free to use and you know, people wanted to get away from paid services, but you know hosting a website like Get Together still costs money. It's got to come from somewhere. Uh, it was originally coming out of my pocket, um, but that's not a sustainable thing. Nobody wants to invest in a service that's just you know one guy's generosity paying for. The original plan was to do a, a freemium model where the base services that individual teams would use would be free and then add-ons like organizational support would be something that an organization would pay for and that payment would go towards sustaining the website. Um, but I didn't really like that model. Like I started adding these features and I really wanted them to be used. I didn't want them to be behind a paywall. Um, so I opened up a Patreon account and got enough contributions through Patreon to pay for the hosting of gettogether.community. And so I did away with the you know, paid features model. So now all of the, the features are free and it's all being provided to people from these Patreon contributors who are, are you know, essentially funding the hosting for it. That's awesome. And I love to see when the community comes together like that. You're providing a tool that the community absolutely can't live without. And the community steps up and says, well, we're going to make sure that you don't go hungry in the process of doing that. And so they, they really stepped up to, to get your back. And I think that's awesome. At this point, do you feel like you're pretty well funded? Do you, you feel, or, or, or could you use more contributions? Right now, we're covering our monthly hosting costs. Um, I've done a lot of things from the get-go to make sure that hosting was as cheap as could be. Um, so we're on AWS right now, which I know isn't the cheapest, but it was really easy to get set up. Um, and it's under $20 a month right now, hosting fee. So, you know, as we grow, it might become more. But right now, the, the donations that I'm getting are covering the hosting cost. That's outstanding. Michael Hall, he is the lead developer of Get Together and a guest this hour on the Ask Noah Show. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to join us and chat with us a little bit about Get Together. We'll get you back on the program soon. Thank you, Noah. 1-855-450-NOAH, that's 855-450-6624, the email, live at asknoahshow.com, make your voice heard, become a part of the program. What if I told you that there was a super fast computer, the fastest super computer in the world, and not only did it run Linux, but it wasn't running on Intel, it wasn't running x86, and it wasn't running ARM, it's running something completely different, built for geeks, by geeks. Well, that's what our next guest this hour is here to talk about. He is Hugh Blemings, and he's the executive director of the Open Power Foundation. Now, the Open Power Foundation, you may have not heard of them, and you may have not heard of the architecture, but it is a continuation of the, of the power architecture that you may be familiar with so many years ago. Now, the Open Power Foundation exists to make sure that Intel has a good run for their money because, and this is why I'm, I'm kind of laughing a little bit, in uh, at, the, at the chat room, Das Geek, dear friend of mine, constantly pushes Team Red. Now, he's more Team Red in the sense of graphics cards. I don't know if that necessarily translates into processors, but the idea behind AMD is to give Intel a run for its money. Now, whether or not they succeed is irrelevant. The important thing here is that Intel has some competition other than themselves, because for a long, long time, NVIDIA's biggest competitor, I'm sorry, for a long, long time, Intel's biggest competitor was Intel, their previous generation of processor. Could they make a processor good enough to outdo their last generation of processor? And the same was true of NVIDIA. Could NVIDIA make a graphics card better than their previous generation of graphics card? And so regardless of who comes out in the end, Linux wins. And that's what we're looking to get to. So there is an alternative architecture out there. It is, it is a competitor to Intel. And... It is called the Power 9, 
And the Power 9 architecture forces processors to get a whole lot better. Now, Power 9 is a multi-threading symmetric multiprocessor based on the, uh, I believe it's uh, Power ISA. You use a 14 nanometer FinFET process. It comes in 12 and 24 core versions, and it's it's designed to be used at scale. And when I say scale, I'm not talking about the conference. I'm talking about to be used in a scalable fashion. And we had a chance to stop by and chat with Hugh Blemings. Now, there are a, a lot of different players involved. And this is what is, quite frankly, a little confusing to me as somebody who has not followed this uh, very deeply for a long time. The There are companies that make Power9 computers. There is obviously IBM who worked on the research part of developing the Power9 chip. And then there's the Open Power Foundation. The Open Power Foundation is the organization that tries to adhere to open standards and make sure that people that want to develop and play in that world are following these standards. Hugh Bleming is the executive director. We had a chance to catch up with him at scale. Here's that audio. We're on the floor at scale, and we stopped by the Open Power booth. Hugh Blemings is my guest. Hey, Hugh, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah, nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to be here. So I guess for those who haven't heard of the Open Power Foundation, give me the 30-second elevator pitch. What is the Open Power Foundation? Right, so we're a, I guess we're a technical consortium, first and foremost, a not-for-profit based here in the U.S., and we promote the use of the power processor architecture in an ecosystem that goes kind of goes along with that. So I sort of think of it as a mixture of a technical standards body and a sort of marketing promotional technical commons all kind of rolled into one. So as a foundation, you're, you're concerned or you're interested in promoting openness. Yep. Uh, explain what the advantage of the openness as it relates to the Open Power Foundation. Sure. So I guess there's a few things. that If we think of us as an open technical commons now, we've understood that open software makes a lot of sense. And what we, pr we, we have a really nice, rich, open software ecosystem around power and open power. But we also promote an open hardware architecture as far as we are able to as well. So we have working groups within our organisation that c come together from the member companies and establish common open protocols around interconnects and uh, standards for the power management and all those sorts of things for the for the systems. And many of our members, not all, but many of our members actually produce hardware that's entirely open source as well in, this, in the standard sort of kind of open hardware sense as well. So this is essentially what it amounts to. We, we get to some real competition from Intel in the x86 standard. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so power itself, you know, it's fair to say Intel and AMD are our, our most obvious competitors. We're talking about a processor architecture in power that is server-grade high performance. It's not a, an overgrown embedded chip, it's a, a full-on server server, server chip, server architecture. So in that sense, Intel and AMD are our competitors, but I think we have a few advantages both in technically but also in, in that sort of openness sort of, sort of piece, and we can talk about that a bit more if that's, if that's useful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Linus Torvalds said a few years ago, he said that x86 is, is going to be dominant because that's where the developers are and that's yeah. where, you know, where everything is going. But uh, the reality is this kind of changes that landscape a little bit. Exactly. And we've been, one of the, the traditional difficulties we'd had with, with power, if we, if we go back, say, 10 years ago, is it was really hard if you're an individual developer, an individual contributor, to get access to power hardware because it was only being made by basically IBM at that point. So IBM kind of realised that and said, well, if we get this, get this foundation together, we can bring in other companies. And they got Google and Tyann, Mellanox and uh, NVIDIA with the, with the founding members. So let's build an ecosystem together that promotes that openness. And we fast forward now to, that's for five years ago, so to, to the present where we've got a number of our members actually producing developer systems that you can buy at a reasonable price yourself. And it's basically comparable to any other machine you pick up from Fry's or where, admittedly the heights of the higher end workstation these are these are high performance systems but as one example this is kind of what we got uh, on the booth uh, here for scale is we've got a company one of our members Raptor who are based in the US and their whole thing is around openness but openness for developers so they actually build systems that are designed for developer ecosystem and priced uh, accordingly, and I don't want to turn in a big sales pitch but it's sort of a I think it's important for us to think we, we've realised there's a I guess an open technical commons that we need open hardware, not just in the embedded space, and there's some fantastic stuff happening there, but we need our developer systems to be trustworthy as well. So power and open power so gives us a few technical advantages. I guess the obvious one is the, the Power 9 chip itself is, um, doesn't have a management engine built in. So as I sometimes joke, like if you want to run Minix on it, you've got to kind of install it yourself. You don't get a free copy with the, with the silicon. But more seriously, it means that the 
uh, IBM and th the, through the foundation has released a lot more documentation about the chip. You can literally find out everything you need to about the parts, including all the little processes on there that do power management. It's all documented. So we end up with a, with a hardware platform that is documented better than just about anything else. It has an entirely open software stack. There are literally no binary blobs on these systems. I think other than a small amount of code for one of the Ethernet adapters and they're even working on, on fixing that. But you end up with a system, you can literally build the whole thing from source and that is unique. And then you can go to the uh, Raptor who make these particular systems in the example, go, and go to their wiki and pull down the schematics and the Gerber files and everything else that, that goes with it. That's just one of our members, uh, Inspur, we've got uh, Wistron, Yadro, a bunch of our other members who all make uh, open power hardware as well. And they're either a combination of um, open hardware and open software, or at least all, can all run an entirely open software stack. Some of them still make traditional kind of closed hardware systems, great bits of kit, but you can still put the entire open software stack on it and have that same benefit of being able to, I guess, reason with what you're, what you're using. That's absolutely awesome. So who is the, who is the target audience for uh, some of these systems? Sure. So I guess it depends on the systems, systems themselves. So kind of right at the high end, you've got the, uh, the first and second fastest supercomputers in the world uh, here in the US who are entirely they're, uh, open, they're open power based. That's uh, um, IBM's AC922 is the main box behind that. And there are a couple of power nines with, I think, like six NVIDIA GPUs attached to each and 4,000 plus nodes. So that's right up one end of it. Uh, in the middle, we've got com uh, com members like Wistron who uh, have a system called Mihawk, which is a nice sort of 2U system designed for, pre for um, AI applications or uh, traditional high-performance computing applications, or just generally cranking out web pages. I mean, they run all the normal Linux and you know, Linux distros, all supported, FreeBSD, all the usual OSs just work. And then we've got kind of the lower end, price point-wise, more so than performance with the, these systems from Raptor who are designed, you can stick them under your desk. We've even had people... Um, look, using these little, um, just point at the camera, but these little Mihawk bo um, Blackbird boards, I should say, Micro ATX form factor, entirely open hardware design, people using these in edge, ap edge applications where they want kind of a really high performance, but essentially embedded kind of a, kind of a platform. So kind of something there for everyone, uh, I guess. That's, I, I love what you guys are doing, and I love what this means for the market, because the reality is companies like Google mm -hmm. um, they want to have something, it doesn't matter who or what, but they want something to compete with Intel because yeah. they, want, they don't want to Intel to control the price. Yeah. Power9 does that. Exactly, and Google's actually an interesting case in point. So Google and Rackspace are both members of the foundation and they actually did something that's kind of interesting in industry. They, 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 they um, collaborated on building a hyperscale node and what they did is they developed a, a common planar or motherboard um, called the... Um, Zaius, Zaius in the case of the Google instance, Barrel-Eye in the case of the Rackspace version. Yes, I did get that the right way. Common planar, entirely open hardware design. Google use them in their data centers. Rackspace use them in their data centers. In the case of the Rackspace design, it's an open compute compliant design as well. So it fits in that beautiful open compute ecosystem as well. Um, and the Google version slots beautifully into their, their hardware infrastructure. And we, we talked to Google about that and it, it's, it's easy to assume possibly slightly cynically that this is just about trying to give Intel a bit of a jab, in, you know, a jab in the ribs so they keep their prices reasonable, but no, actually there's architectural advantages with the chip that Google and Rackspace and other companies see that makes it worth putting in the data centre just on that, that alone. It's not just a price driver for them. So let's dig into that just for a second. Power 8 and Power 9, that is the architecture, or Power 9, Power 10, that's the architecture that you're pushing yeah. and that's, you know, what's being developed. What is it? So... I guess it's a, that's a good question. So at its core, it's a chip. I mean, Power 9 itself is actually a specific microprocessor made by, by, by IBM. It's a risk, risk, risk processor architecture. It's a, um, a continuation, or you can trace its lineage back to the PowerPC chips of 15 years ago, so sort of thing. So it's the same, same architecture, uh, so same instruction set architecture, I should say, underneath, but really nicely evolved over the years. Now, it's, it's, but it's also not just the chip. Power9 itself is the part, but then there's a whole top, entire software and hardware ecosystem that goes around that that does, defines the interfaces and so forth. There's some interesting stuff with Power9, I guess, that's worth calling out to a sort of a technical readership, I think, is that um, it's always been a bit of a feeds, feeds machine, as they call it, in a sense it's very much been about memory and I.O. bandwidth, so it's DDR4 RAM, controllers on board, it's PCIe Gen 4 by default, so you've already got double 
the, um, the memory and I.O. bandwidth just out of the blocks, or the, kind of at a hardware level mm. in, in that sense. But power's always been architected to be really efficient from a DMA so standpoint, um, uh, really, exo really exotic and um, well thought through, interrupt controls, all those sorts of things. So it's just a nice, rich, really sort of sensibly designed to, and it's kind of evolved cleanly mm. over the years as well. And, I had a fantastic conversation with one of our one of our members a few few weeks ago, based out of Europe actually, who had a customer who were really interested in Power Nine. So, awesome, great, why, why? And it turns out they've got this big chunk of assembler code that was originally written for a 32-bit Power PC 15 years ago that they cannot change. So I infer, you know, they haven't got the source code or who knows what, but they want to be able to run. And they, sure enough, they are able to take that, put put a little bit of shim code around it. Ran beautifully, so things. So that's the, the benefits of a nice, clean uh, evolution of architecture. As so well. it is an evolution of the yeah. power, original power PC. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of we sometimes you know, it's the reports of our death are greatly, greatly exaggerated or whatever that wonderful quote is. But yeah, you can actually trace that sort of lineage all the way back. And in fact, the actual Power Nine chips themselves use little Power PC thirty two engines to do power management and stuff like that on the chips. So. That's fantastic. That is, cool. I, that is really cool, yeah. and it's it, it it is a it's a throwback, and and I like that. I also understand that Power Nine, Power Ten, they're particularly suited for people that want highly customized machines. Talk about that. Yeah. So the um, there's a few things you can look at there. I mean, we, we talked about PCI is a pretty standard sort of a sort of an interface, but um, the Power Nine and we Power Ten we know a little bit about. IBM have disclosed some stuff there, but. Um, Power 9 has uh, NVLink, on, which is a, a, a cache coherent interconnect to, to connect to NVIDIA GPUs. I can get like 20, north of 20 gigabytes a second per connection for that. Um, and you've got OpenCAPI, which is an open standard, accomplishes a similar sort of thing, again, a cache coherent accelerator interconnect. Bit of a mouthful. But what that means is you can connect FPGAs or GPUs directly to the processor at a much, much higher connection speed. And from a programming model, it's cache coherent, so it appears in the same memory address space. Practical outcome of that is much, much higher performance, but much, much uh, easier programming models. In terms of customizing that, I guess there's a couple of different levels. When uh, people who join the foundation or, or companies who join the Open Power Foundation are actually able to access technical resources through the foundation. A lot of those come from IBM because they're the subject matter experts on the, the design side, but they'll actually help them design planars or design an entire system. We've got uh, some members in the foundation who are building small embedded systems. In one case, I think this is a Power 8 design. They actually literally soldered the, the uh, CPU onto the onto the planar because it was a in, going into a high vibration environment. So there's a lot of customization options there as well. And we're increasingly hearing and seeing now members come into the foundation, do that sort of development with, with other partners, and then they turn those around and make those an open hardware design in their own right. So it helps build that sort of uh, ecosystem up there as well. With the advent of ARM and it, ARM becoming so prolific, why the investment in the power infrastructure? Why not look at something similar like ARM? Well, I guess ARM's, uh, ARM kind of is a competitor in a sense. I mean, and I don't say that to be cute or clever, but that's a simple, simple fact of the matter. But ARM's traditional, tra traditional strength, and to this day, I mean, my phone runs on, is, mm -hmm. is the, the lower power and relatively low compute environment. Now, they're catching up. They make good parts, to be sure, but, but they're still sort of it's playing in a slightly different different space to, to where, where we were at. Power's always been a, a high-end sort of high processor server architecture. Arm's kind of working up. Power's history, if you go back to PowerPC, of course, is in the embedded space as well. And the old expression, I think, was palm tops to, to teraflops, or palm, palm tops to petaflops, probably. Um, so from an architectural standpoint, you can build those low-end parts. And there are still PowerPC parts used in embedded applications, including the Mars Rover and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a wide ecosystem there. But, but um, yeah, I think playing in slightly different but complementary spaces. There are, there's undoubtedly going to be somebody out there that's listening to this and saying, I want to try this, I want to give this a run. Yeah. Talk to me about what distros run on Power9? I assume it's primarily a Linux thing. Yep. Is it, I mean, can I just go download Ubuntu Fedora and run them? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I actually know, like, the software side is almost uninteresting. It just works. Mm -hmm. Like, it's sort of, um, <laughs> Power is one of the oldest non-Intel ports to say the Linux kernel and the GNU tool chain and so forth. So, so Debian works on it, Red Hat, Ubuntu, Slez, they all just work. You know, you know it's, that side is almost uninteresting. Uh, FreeBSD is ported, runs really, really nicely as well. Power is unique in being a chip that is by Endian. It can run big Endian and little Endian at the same time with no performance overhead. So, interestingly, free, the FreeBSD port 
excuse me, is Big Endian. Most Linux distros are now have settled on Little Endian just for sort of simplicity of compatibility with uh, with the Intel Intel chips, and because people can't write software that doesn't necessarily <laughs> very well. <coughs> excuse me. But we've got a couple of distros out there who are still Big Endian as well as Power traditionally was. And from a kernel standpoint, in talking to the crew at uh, at Auslabs who do a lot of the kernel work, they're very much committed to having both continue to, to run. So the software side is really really nice. Then you've got a really rich uh, kind of com commercial software ice, ice, that commercial software ecosystem out there as well, and a lot of our members produce really nice traditional commercial software accelerator databases, um, AI applications are a big one for power and, uh, and so on and so forth. In terms of um, individual developers or people who want to kind of get access and play with it themselves, like yeah, you can just pull down the ISO, and the hardware is now again at a point where you know, the members of, of ours we just go to the website, order a machine, and it'll show up the the next day. Talk to me about Talos, because I assume that's what you're referring to when yeah, you say right. that people are going to, you know, you can purchase a machine that shows up just like you would buy from Dell or anything else. Talk yeah. to me about Talos. What is it? So, well, so Talos is a, is a, the company is actually Raptor, Raptor Computing Systems. So they have two products now, um, the Talos 2, which is the machine, so just to your, to your left there, that's a two socket design, uh, Power 9, uh, entirely open hardware, entirely open software stack that runs on that. And actually that's very much been Raptor's focus is, is on the openness of their software stack. So they, they've, they're really, really committed to that. They basically really push very hard to only have hardware on their systems that has open drivers and where they don't to work with the community to, to build them. So got the Talus, which is kind of a mid to high end developer workstation, uh, one or two socket design. You can put like two terabytes of RAM in it, go up to 22 cores per socket, four threads per core, power nines are four thread per, per core design by default for the, for the chips we use. Um, and then they've also just released, or well, just about to start shipping, they announced it mid late last year, uh, a micro ATX form factor motherboard, the one I held up earlier, which is the Blackbird, and that's designed as a, that's a single socket design, a couple of um, DIMM slots, a couple of PCI slots. And they're targeting that, I think, to be like $1,200 US, including a four core CPU. Now, some of your readers are going, or listeners are going to go, well, hang on, that's quite a lot of money for a motherboard, but you get, you're getting the CPU with, with, with that, but you're also getting a system that's kind of mid to high end performance, it's not sort of a simple low end x86 chip, so you, you really are getting a much, much higher performance part. And again, entirely open hardware design, entirely open. You can probably tell whether, and it's it's interesting, like when particularly at shows like this, and I had a, been, I've had a really, we had a really great year last year being out and talking to people at a lot of these sorts of events. The performance side of things almost un, is uninteresting, like people just get that, like it's assumed you wouldn't be talking to me if it wasn't a fast right. computer kind of thing. But when you get people thinking about the implications of that openness and that ability to reason with this software and hardware, so like, yeah, kind of why aren't we, why, why aren't we doing more of this kind of thing? So, yeah. Hugh Bleming, he is the executive director of the Open Power Foundation and a guest this hour on the Ask Snow Show. Hugh, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. We look forward, looking forward to get you back on the program real soon. Nice one. No, thanks for your time. Thanks for your listeners' time too. Cheers. Make sure to check out the video portion of that interview. We'll post those on a separate YouTube channel. Again, we did another interview with, it wasn't really with Facebook. We just kind of took over their booth for a little bit. William and I did it. One of my favorite videos that I think I've ever published on Linux. Absolutely fantastic. Also, the video interview with, with uh, Hugh Blemings. You can see the hardware that he's actually exemplifying. And we've got shots of it. It is insanely powerful and very cool to look at. Make sure to check that out. You can get the link at podcast.asknoahshow.com. I'll the link right to the YouTube channel where we've got the video portion of that interview, which will be published later this week. Our project spotlight this week is INXI. Now, INXI is a full-featured CLI system administration or information tool, rather. While INXI was originally written in Bash with version 3, INXI has been completely rewritten in Perl. Now, it's available in most Linux distributions or repositories and does its best to support the BSDs, whatever that is. It comes pre-installed with Solus OS, Crutchbang, uh, Epidemic, Linux Mint, Antix, Arch, Linux, Debian, Ubuntu, Gentoo, Slackware, OpenSUSE, Red Hat, uh, or I'm sorry, it's Red Hat Apple, so you have to have the Apple repository. And many others have INXI packaged in either their primary or secondary repositories. So make sure to check out INXI and see what uh, your system has available for information. See if that's a useful tool for you. Again, you can find links to that, again, as well as everything we talk about in the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. 
I want to give one more last plug for our Linux user group that's coming up on Friday. There was a bit of a time communication error. The get together site, we inadvertently published the wrong time. It will be at 6 p.m. Now, if you're listening to the show and that's where you're getting your information, then you've had the correct time the whole time, as it were. If you were following just the get together, though, there was a mistake on there. We have it corrected now. It'll be at 6 p.m. Uh, we're expecting a decent turnout. There's also a possibility of a gentleman from Red Hat giving us a remote presentation. We're going to try and dial in some details and we'll have those available as soon as possible. Of course, get together. Community has the uh, ability for us to actually publish speaker information. Uh, so it's a fantastic tool. And if uh, the I interview itself didn't impress you enough, then take my word for it. You have to go check out get together. Community. But if you're in the Grand Forks area, in the Minneapolis area, Fargo area, and you can make the drive. We'd love to have you. It's going to be at the University of North Dakota in the Gamble Hall, uh, where, and it will be on this coming Friday at 6 p.m. Central. We hope to see you there. Did you know this episode is available as a downloadable podcast? That's right. To download the latest episode, visit podcast.asknoahshow.com. There you'll find the latest, not only the latest episode, but all of the articles referenced in this episode. You can get the latest, of course, by following us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. You can follow me personally at Colonel Linux if you'd like to. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. A huge thanks to Ben, our producer, Sarah, our call screener. This hour of the show may be over, but we got plenty more content for you 24-7 at AskNoahShow.com. See you next week. <laughs>